Okay, so buen día para Dichibiguri. My name is Dr. Jessica Hernandez, and I'm from the Maya Chorti and Binisa Nations. Thank you for being today here at the panel entitled Indigenous Perspectives on Environmental Justice. So before we begin, um, I would like to give a quick session description. So today we're going to be discussing about cultural erasure, political disenfranchisement, economic divestment, and an ever-growing climate crisis that has accumulated in many indigenous communities facing dire environmental injustices and health disparities. In this session, panelists belonging to a diverse um, indigenous and tribal backgrounds in advocacy and academia will discuss their views on the present environmental energy and climate justice movements. So I would like to um, give each panelist 10 seconds to introduce themselves. So let's start with Joseph. Well, um, my name is Joseph Gazing Wolf. I'm uh, from the Lakota people at Standing Rock. Uh, my mother is also Amazig and Nubian from North Africa. Uh, I am a senior global future scientist at Arizona State University uh, and currently completing my PhD there as well. And you can pass it to somebody else. Thank you. I can just go if it makes it easier because because once you're on screen, you can't see the other names, right? <laughs> so it's, yeah. 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 Uh, ja uh, Jacqueline, maybe, or somebody else. Okay. okay. Hello. 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 I'm echoing. My, my name is Jacqueline Shirley. Um, I'm calling in from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm a tribal member of the native village of Hooper Bay in um, southwest Alaska. Welcome, everybody, to our session. Thank you. And whoever's next, I can't see anybody. Okay, Deborah. Oh, Deborah. Thank you. I'll go next. <laughs> I know. I think that was the, the issue there before. So, um, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're dialing in from. I am calling in or um, steam yarding in, I guess you could say, from uh, Toronto, Ontario. And so, Oni Bonjour. My name is Deborah McGregor. <clears throat> I am from Whitefish River First Nation. I'm in Anishinaabe. Right now, I am um, at uh, in Toronto. So, quite a ways from home and uh, looking forward to this discussion this afternoon and thank you for joining us. Hi, I can go next. Yeah, hey everyone, it's Chelsea Chi. I'm the Deputy Director for Native Renewables. It's nice to be here. I'm excited to have this conversation. And last but not least, Amber. Peche, everyone. Estongo, Amber, Chaho Chepkados, Ishti Muskogo Gidoes, Lestogidoes, Lojagogi, Amalegida Dos, Lojapoga, Amatova Dos. Hi, everybody. I'm Amber. I'm Muskogi, an African American. Uh, my tribal town is Lojapoga, and my clan is the Turtle Clan. Um, I'm currently in Portland, Oregon, or Kalapuya land. And I'm really excited to have this conversation um, with my fellow panelists. And yeah, thanks for having me, Maro. Okay, thank you all for introducing yourself. So Buendeo Padiuchi, as mentioned, I'm Dr. Jessica Hernandez and I will be today's moderators. Um, I'll be moderating from Cada, Cado and Capao lands, also known as Little Rock, Arkansas. So our first question for the entire panel is cultural erasure, political disenfranchisement, economic divestment, and an ever-growing climate crisis has accumulated in indigenous communities facing dire environmental and climate injustices as well as health disparities. What are some of the current environmental burdens that indigenous communities face today? And we can start with Amber, and then you can call on the next person, Amber. 
Okay, uh, so I think that one of the biggest um, uh, obstacles or you know problems that Indigenous peoples face um, is like the constant erasure and dispossession of both of our like culture and our our lands and um, access to um, yeah the right to tribal and cultural sovereignty. Right, I think that a lot of um, our problems have to do with, you know, settler colonialism, white supremacy, and racial capitalism. I think uh, so many of us are striving to um, to undo the the legacy of all of the, those issues that we currently face on a daily basis. And so, I think having the right to um, our sovereignty, having actualized sovereignty, um, to be able to make decisions for ourselves, to make decisions for uh, the places that we call home, the places that we should that we should have the right to stewardship. Um, those, you know, there is no such thing as environmental justice without land back, without um, you know recognizing and um, validating the stewardship and the sovereignty that Indigenous people globally have. Right. So um, I think a lot of our outcomes, our health outcomes, our disparities have a lot to do with. Um, you know, the the types of genocides we face, right? The type of dispossessions that we face. And so um, I think that again, their climate injustice, um, environmental injustice, all of that has to do with the ways in which we have been um, forcibly removed, forcibly displaced, um, and then our sovereignty not uh, recognized. So um, I'm not a statistician, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a researcher, but what I do know is people on the ground um, have tangible real life acute um, disparities because of this ongoing legacy of settler colonialism, white supremacy, racial capitalism. Um, and that's, yeah, that's my overall take. Whoever would like to go next, because I can't see the next person, <laughs> um, have at it. How about Joseph? Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Starks. Um, <laughs> so, um, Amber, <laughs> um, thank you so much. Uh, so, you know, for me, that what's fresh on my mind now is where where um, where I was working this summer, which is this picture behind me here. Um, uh, along the Napo River in Ecuador, where I was working with the Quechua people, and then further up the river, the Waurani people. And, you know, while we were there, we we uh, organized a uh, uh, protest and a resistance because what's going on here um, is essentially what's what's been going on all over Indian country, um, that is planet Earth, um, uh, everywhere, with every indigenous nation that I've worked with. Um, in North Africa, you know, Southeast Asia, here in Latin America. Um, basically, the local politicians are paid off um, by oil and mining companies. And then these, these oil and mining companies uh, come in and illegally tear down the forest and, um, you know, engage in their extractive methodologies. And then they throw any toxins uh, into the rivers, um, you know, any garbage that they have, they throw into the rivers. And so um, basically, as you're traveling down this river that these indigenous communities use for everything, right? Uh, for, for food, for water, uh, you know, to, to sustain the forest itself, which, which sustains them, um, you you find just giant packs of trash. You, the, the waters become murky with all the uh, chemical toxins that these companies uh, dump into it. Um, you know, and, and we're talking companies like Chevron and Shell, et cetera. And then these, these companies come in and um, basically say, well, you know, you poor indigenous people, like you can't sustain your own lands anymore, right? You have no, no sustainable livelihoods. Um, uh, you can't feed your own family. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to create sustainable livelihoods for you. You're going to come work for us. Um, and in fact, there's a whole city called Shell. You know, welcome to Shell, Ecuador. Um, we're going to build a whole city uh, where, you know, we'll, we'll build houses for you guys there. Um, just leave the forest. Uh, come live here. Um, you know, we'll give you we'll give you good pay. And then you'll work for us now. Right? So so many of these communities have become uh, divided in terms of, uh, you know, families and, and communities that stay in the forest and try to continue to protect 
protect the forest and others that have kind of uh, been squeezed out of that lifestyle by, by many different means, some of which I just mentioned, uh, into going and working for these same companies. And so it's literally brother against brother, cousin against cousin, um, uh, uh, fighting uh, either to protect the forest or to work for these extractive uh, and illegal mining operations that are taking place. So, so that's just one example of, of many that's going on um, along the Amazon basin. And, and like I said, all over the world where I work, uh, similar things are happening. Thank you for that, Joseph. Um, Deborah? So just to, to build upon what others have already mentioned and in response to the question, I thought um, one of the fundamental challenges is uh, as pointed out is um decision making your i find indigenous folks at whatever level um are often on the outside looking in and then in a position of advocacy um activism uh, protection for example water protectors you're not you don't get to be the decision maker so you're trying to influence decision making even within your own uh, on your own territories or you're trying to influence policy you're always trying to influence um even internationally in in the, that uh, those forums so i think this this um lack of decision making is hugely problematic because it's already situating indigenous people in a particular uh, silo <laughs> you're not decision makers or um or we need to help uh, indigenous people. So there's already kind of a box for uh, indigenous peoples, First Nations or, or tribal peoples, uh, indigenous peoples around the world, as opposed to actually, you should be a decision maker, you should be directing, influencing global policy, public policy, um, as opposed to um, actually uh, being able to to lead in the way that folks are like, I mean, it could happen internally, but maybe that relates to the to the second question. But that's kind of what I see, is that as a pointed out, where the origin of the Injustice is often external to the community, but you're you're not in a decision making um, kind of um, position. the the other The other aspect that I that I see to this in in the Canadian context more specifically, because I can't speak to um, what's happening um, with tribes per se. What I see is um, because we're not we're not seen as decision makers, even though communities are making decisions all the time at the community level. But in these broader frameworks, um, not making decisions on the outside, looking in, have to go to litigation, whatever, trying to trying to influence this decision making, is there there isn't really support to support indigenous decision making, despite the rhetoric, despite oh there's indigenous governance, sovereignty, self determination, but communities in in the Canadian context, I'm comfortable more saying, need the capacity and the support to be able to do that. Um, and often they're not. The, the support comes from, let's say, my participation in this initiative, my participation in, in this policy making venture. It's not, hey, maybe we want to make these decisions ourselves and need support ourselves in my own community or, um, or uh, uh, nation to be able to make these decisions. So there's a real, fundamentally, I guess, a lack of respect for what First Nations decision making and governance um, and autonomy and sovereignty looks like people don't they don't, they don't want you there they just want you to input into other processes so so that's why um, just building upon what others have said that that I've noticed is um, a huge challenge thank you yeah thank you for that right like the lack of um, respect that is often per, you know given to indigenous communities kind of prevents us from having some power in that decision making in these colonial entities Chelsea, to repeat the question again, what are some of the current environmental burdens that Indigenous communities face today? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to provide a little bit of context before answering this question, um, because Indigenous communities are so many of us, and a lot of us are have different cultures and different languages, different experiences. Yeah, there are some that are overlapping and um, some that are similar, but I just wanted to create that context and I'm only able to speak on what I've experienced as a Navajo young person and then working both in the community um, at the grassroots level and then also in the political realm for a while and now as a nonprofit um, working to, to um, increase access for 
and energy independence for the homes that we install solar for. Um, for the environmental burdens that I've seen, both for the Diné Navajo Nations and for Hopi is um, restoration and rebalance. Uh, the, there are histories of organizations, companies, entities coming in and wanting things from Native people and not sharing the whole story, um, lots of other things there. But once they leave, there's all of these gaps that are left. There's water that um, was used to help with the industry to make it what it is today um, in energy industries, and that can't be replaced. Um, water that could be used for drinking water to grow food, to create, you know, in, um, to keep sustainable communities alive. And then also with families, uh, Joseph kind of mentioned that um, sometimes when industry comes in and they leave, they leave some, some they, they leave some hard, um, harmful relationships uh, between families and communities. And so when they're gone, it's up to the communities to restore and rebalance that. And it's taking a really long time and it's going to take a really long time. Um, those are just like little pieces of the environmental burdens that I've seen. Additionally, not only the land that's um, not the land that was used for energy production or extraction can't be, it's, it's never going to be what it was before. So how do you restore that land to be something that we can use now? Um, another piece, um, I know it says envir uh, environmental burdens now is because of global warming and, and the weather that we're seeing now in the Southwest is pretty extreme. So there are in the summers, our monsoon seasons have been pretty intense. Yes, the 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 moisture is a blessing, but when it comes down in huge amounts and our we're not ready for those things, our thoroughfares, our roads to get from our homes to a paved road is now demolished and getting from home to a grocery store or a home to a clinic or home to school is just a little harder. Same thing for the winter time. We had some, again, pretty amazing moisture, but our, I'm going to say in the most recent future, we haven't seen those things. And so it's, challenging for us to do things like I had, like I said, get groceries, get medicine. Um, and additionally, those are just like a, a little piece of, of some of the burdens that are like my community faces. Um, and to be one, I think the one that hits me the hardest is for Navajo and Hopi. They've had a coal, a coal mine um, for almost 40 years in their land, our, their lands. And but the, the coal was used to electrify southern Arizona and um, part of Nevada, um, Phoenix, Tucson, and Las Vegas got energy because of our community members. And those community members, and a lot of them, don't have electricity. So that, for me, was it's a huge question. Like, how is that possible for the people who are contributing to electricity for other people? not having that, not having access to it. Um, and so for me, working with Native Renewables, I wanted to be a part of that solution and try to to be not, to address those burdens. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. I think it's important, right, to mention how climate change is kind of exacerbating these environmental burdens that our communities are already experiencing. And also mentioning that as Indigenous peoples, right, even though oftentimes policies and discourses treat us as one group, we're very distinct in our own identities. So to reemphasize the question, and we can move to Jacqueline, what are some of the current environmental burdens that Indigenous communities face today? Uh, thank you. Um, well, on the question, I just, I kind of, um, you know, of course, I echo everything and support um, all my panelists and what they said, Koyana. Um, I just want to kind of go back to the precursor um, of the descriptor before the um, question. Cultural erasure, political disenfranchisement, economic disinvestment, 
ever-growing climate crisis have accumulated in many indigenous communities facing desire and desire, dire environmental and climate injustices and health disparities. That's the answer to the question, all that. Um, so whoever uh, gave the precursor um, did their uh, research well, because that's the answer to the question, all that. Of course, I was, um, um, Amber, she uh, hit on exactly when I first read the question, that word current, because this is not an acute current thing that tribal nations and indigenous people have been facing. It has been um, centuries. And we have always had environmental burdens since we were existed, but we've always been able to move, be nomadic and work with our environment as environment um, presents itself to us, not the other way around. So as we have become uh, civilized and, and forced to be non-nomadic, especially in rural Alaska and in Alaska, it is um, created a lot of havoc both with our animals and with our humans and with our waters and with our plants. You know, even um, the term permafrost, pretty soon somebody's gonna have to change the name of that because it's not permanent anymore. The permafrost is melting. And so um, scientists now and society now, you guys are worried about, uh, you know, the methane, oh, well, um, that is nothing compared to what is going to be released once that loop starts really moving forward when all that permafrost starts melting. So for um, Alaska and many coastal um, cities and towns and villages in our coastal um, coastline in this country, it's about reloc relocation, what's happening to um, um, these communities that are having to be forcibly relocated because of erosion. And so that is one critical um, issue in um, Alaska I can I can uh, speak on. And I work with thir the, within the 13 uh, western states. And so many um, uh, tribes within the 13 um, states, including Hawaii, our indigenous brothers and sisters there have been suffering um, from all the precursors before the question. And so, um, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask, answer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jacqueline. And I think that's important what you mentioned, right, that our Kanaka Maoli brothers and sisters are suffering necessarily these dire environmental burdens. We're seeing how in Hawaii, right, Maui, experience that wildfire and while knowing that climate change doesn't necessarily directly result in wildfires it results in the conditions that create these massive wildfires so to move on to our next question um and oftentimes right as indigenous peoples we're asked for the solutions to these problems that we are not necessarily responsible for are there any suggestions on what we can do to lessen the burden while also enhancing climate and energy justice within these communities, and particularly our communities, right? The communities that we work with, given that as indigenous peoples, we're not a monolithic group. And I will start with Deborah this time. Hey, thank you. It's, um, it, it's a great question. I think what I would, uh, I'll just speak to sort of, my thinking at the moment because I think there is a lot of um, there, there's a lot of generations of um, generation of solutions that people that people have come up with but what I'm particularly interested in in the research that I'm engaging with now and particularly um, indigenous climate justice is indigenous communities or nations however they're organizing themselves governance governance wise to to come up with their own sol solutions, and, and again, this may be specific to the to the Canadian context, where uh, a lot of the times um, we're in a position of reacting to other people's solutions, 
and um, and not really having the opportunity to generate our own. If we want to call them solutions or, or pathways to, to sustainability, people have different sort of visions for for what they see as as um, popping out of this this scenario that um, that others have talked about. And in the previous question, like outlining all those inequities and dysfunction and basically kind of genocidal <laughs> uh, tendencies by by the state in relation to um, indigenous peoples. So to me, I'd like to see um, Indigenous people starting to cr create those themselves based on their own knowledge, their own science, their, their own way of life, their own values, and what their strengths are. Um, now, this is not to say all these other situations, um, inequities and burdens are there. People talked about them quite eloquently to the, to the first question. It's just, I, I find in, in the context that I often work in, um, other other people, usually governments and their, the kind of funding programs that they have or ENGOs and others, they kind of decide, um, this is what we understand the problem to be. This is what we have to offer up to you, Indigenous peoples, apply for this or work with us on this, as opposed to it coming from um, Indigenous peoples themselves. Having said that, I actually think a lot of Indigenous people do. I think a lot of the, I just call them the dots, already exist within communities, the language revitalization programs, the land-based programs, work with youth. Um, to me, those are where um, innovation and creativity is going to be generated um, to be able to kind of see past a thing that's blowing up in our face to envision some kind of future that we want to, that we want to move towards. I think... Um, I mean, in Ishtabek in particular, we are visionary people, right? Like we, we're, we're seeking this, this vision um, in terms of our lives and our future and what's going to enable us to do that. Um, it's usually not other people's solutions. It's usually generating them um, ourselves. So I don't know exactly what those programs are going to look like. I've seen them. I know people have developed climate change programs, developing their own plans and strategies. But in the Canadian context, we're a bit behind on that in terms of at the community or the First Nation level, most of the time we're we're inputting into other people's solutions. And if you if you challenge them, people get pretty uptight about that. <laughs> You're, they they spend a lot of energy and time into trying to um, get you to come along to that sort of um, to that sort of solution because they're often not rooted in um, Indigenous life ways, which did maintain um, you know, sustainable relationships over time. And I'm not saying we were perfect in the Anishinaabe context, certainly we weren't, but we learned from that. And because we were, you know, sovereign and self-determining for really most of our existence, thousands of years, we could solve it on our own. But now we've got these other um, factors, these other um, interferences in our ability to be able to be able to do that. So I'd like to see um, the generation of, of programs coming from the from the community itself as opposed to constantly putting all our energy into reacting to what other people's um, solutions are. So hopefully that made sense. Uh, I know I'm not dealing with the big questions, but it's just sort of where I'm at and what I'm seeing um, in the work that I'm doing. So uh, chimigwech for for allowing me to um, share that. Yeah, Babuchi, thank you, Deborah. I think that's important what you emphasize, right? Where these solutions have to come from the indigenous communities themselves, as opposed to these other outside entities trying to solve our issues when they don't necessarily know what our communities are undergoing. So to move on again to the same question, what are some of the solutions that you propose to for us to achieve climate and energy justice within our communities? Joseph, I will send it to you. So just based on my experience of kind of working on the ground with, with different communities, both here in North America and elsewhere, um, you know, two, just two things that I would say have been, have been fairly successful uh, is bringing communities together. So, so in, you know, one of the big things I work on is indigenous unity and trying to bring different um different tribes and communities together because I've seen it where it's worked to empower the individual communities through knowledge sharing, through, you know, political activism, um, et cetera. We, we're a much more powerful voice if we're, you know, seven tribes coming together rather than one. Um, and I've seen this work in, you know, um, 
the north among the northeastern uh, plains tribes back home for me uh, with the Ocheti Chakuin, for example, um, and, and the whole Standing, standing Rock debacle. Uh, and I've seen it work in Latin America and Africa and, and elsewhere where I've worked, where if we bring uh, different communities together, we can, we can mount greater protests and uh, greater resistance and share resources, et cetera. And so that, that's one way that we can lessen the burden is to come together as relatives. Um, of course, that, that creates its own set of problems, right? Um, uh, which is understandable, but, um, but I, think, I think the benefits far out with the problems in this case. Um, and the other thing is to, to think about, um, to kind of go back to our roots in terms of thinking about how we handle resources. So um, with, within our communities, um, the communities that are really struggling. So like in, in this part of the world behind me here, uh, where I work with a smaller Quechua community, uh, in the six weeks that I was there, something like five different families ended up losing their land and having to having to move, which which decimates the family, you know, the, the languages go away, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, and then the foreigners who are coming in and buying up these lands instantly do things like, you know, turn them into pig farms. So, so the forest is completely cleared and then you establish a pig farm right next to this uh, water source that uh, feeds into the Amazon River eventually, right? So, so it's, it's just a complete and utter destruction of both indigenous culture, indigenous language and the environment that, that we all rely on. So, um, so the, 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 the solution uh, in this case um, that I've seen, be, well, the communities that I've seen uh, resist this type of displacement that's taking place all over the world at the moment, and especially in the Amazon, is if they hold land as a community, right? So if they form a foundation, if the tribal community forms a foundation and they hold it in, in, in a communal possession, as opposed to individual families owning specific plots, that paradigm seems to work much better in terms of protecting indigenous land and keeping it in indigenous hands. Uh, and so um, that's another solution, right? So again, indigenous unity uh, across tribes, but also unity within tribes in terms of natural resources management. Um, uh, those, are, those are two really effective methods. The other thing that, um, again, within our own communities that, that has worked is having, you know, having good leadership, um, having strong leadership that is concerned about the tribe uh, and not concerned about bottom lines or feeding their own pockets or feeding their own power structures or whatever. So ha having, having um, leadership that is answerable to the people, um, that's also very important uh, because in many, in many situations when uh, some local communities side, say, with oil and gas companies, it's usually because their leadership is being paid by the oil and gas companies, right? Uh, and so there's there's quite a bit of corruption that takes place, unfortunately, among Indians as with, with any other community in the world. And so uh, it's very important that we monitor who we elect, who we place in places of leadership, um, et cetera. So, so those are just some suggestions. Uh, and then of course, on the flip side uh, of, of what we do, you know, protests and resistance and putting our bodies on the line and all the things that we've been doing as communities across the world to protect our uh, native ecologies, our ancestral ecologies, uh, we need to continue to do that. In Ecuador, for example, um, you know, tribes are constantly launching lawsuits against oil and gas companies, against the government itself, uh, against local governors uh, that are corrupt, um, et cetera. So, so uh, taking things to court, unfortunately, um, is, often, is often another way that, that we can handle this problem. Yeah, thank you, Joseph, for that. So we're going to move into the next question, and this question is for Jacqueline, but anyone else can chime in as well. What does environmental justice mean to you? And I think that this is very important, right, given that Chelsea also mentioned that as Indigenous peoples, we're all not, not a monolithic group. So what does environmental justice mean to you, and how do you incorporate environmental justice principles into your work? So Jacqueline, can you take this one? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so what does the EJ mean to me? Well, that means, um, you know, 
everything um, as a as a, a tribal woman um, it means uh, protecting not only myself but also my family, my clan, my tribe, the animals who feed um, and clothe my family, clan, and tribe, the waters that allow those animals to live in them, and the plants and the tundra. That is environmental justice to me um, and trying to fight for all those societies, the animal society, the plant society, the water society, the air society. So there, because the human society um, are inter-reliant, interdependent, interwoven into all those societies. We are all different societies um, that need each other. And as a, a Yupik woman, protecting and honoring those other societies that are on this earth is my responsibility. And that is, um, as you know, in my um, TEK world, you know, vision, because traditional ecological knowledge is this, you know, uh, traditional ecological knowledge is, it is a policy in the United States that th thankfully, finally it's an EO, but it is an individual and a collective um, form of existence. How I try to incorporate EJ principles into my work, I try to share my TEK with non-tribal um, people. I tried as a as a NEJAC member on the, uh, you know, I sit on the National Environmental Justice Advisor Council to the EPA. I also advocate to my uh, organization and network with some success so far on developing a EJ working group uh, network wide. Um, always putting in uh, proposals to um, uh, give a session on EJ 101 and how us as um, uh, rural development specialists um, do our work through an EJ lens in our rural communities. And what does that really mean to do our work through an EJ lens? When we go into a community to help one neighborhood do economic development, are we making sure that even the less than the less are at the table and, and have been acknowledged in those plans and in those um, motions within that community that we think we're going into the community and helping them out. But we have to make sure that we look around the corner and make sure that all are involved. So um, I really try to, um, as a cultural burial and as uh, certain um, responsibilities I have in my tribe. Like my grandma told me, she goes, well, maybe if people know more about the Yupik, they wouldn't want to kill us. So I, I take it upon myself to try to be an educator of those these things. And um, environmental justice is both a personal tribal thing within myself as a as a Yupik woman and also as a as a professional trying to uh, incorporate EJ principles into my organization's practice as we work in um, rural communities in the um, what 13 Western states. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you for the work that you do and also for highlighting right that responsibility that we are we carry as indigenous peoples since the day we're born to the day we leave this earth. So to pass on the question to Chelsea, what does environmental justice mean to you and how do you incorporate environmental justice principles into your work? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, to me, environmental justice means balance, reciprocity and respect. Um, putting in what you're going to get out and actually putting in even more than you're going to get out, um, being thankful 
for the things that the environment's offering um, and not taking advantage. And that includes not only the land, the water, all of the minerals, um, subsurface, the things we cannot see, also the organisms that live in those in those um, environments and then all the ones that we can see in here. Um, and the ways in which uh, Native Renewables um, and myself use EJ principles is from the products we use. We um, work really hard to, to look for products that are um, recyclable, ones that will last a really long time, um, other that others that are made um, in the best way possible. Um, we're still looking for, you know, as many good products that um, also do little, have a little impact on in the environment. And some of those things are still being worked out. And so we are constantly on the lookout. We want to make sure that what we put out in the land is actually not going, is not going to offer any damage. Additionally, the off-grid solar units we, we install are for families um, that don't have electricity, that are really far from the utility grid, um, from like a half a mile to five miles to 10 miles, people who can't connect. Um, so we, we do our best to work with those folk who are um, who, who may never have thought that they'd get electricity. So as Jacqueline had mentioned, you know, when, when something is being created and looking around the corner to see who else is not there and who's not being included in the conversation, those are the folks that we want to work with. Um, and then lastly, I mean, we use a lot of it, but one of the other pieces is informing and including our our um, staff members who are from a lot of the communities that we work with into our decision making at um, uh, for our organization. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea, for that. So Deborah, what does environmental justice mean to you and how do you incorporate environmental justice principles into your work? Thank you, just to, to build upon the, um, the great responses that were already provided. Um, the way the way that I, I think about it, I do think about it in distinct, I think, again, Indigenous or Anishinaabek sort of distinct ways in the conventional sort of definition of in, environmental justice, which I think are perfectly valid and needed. Clearly, there's lots of nasty things happening. But one of the things I always try to do is like, what is our own sort of thinking around this? Like what's our own fancy word ontology around um, environmental justice? What do we even consider to be environment? I think Jacqueline did a great job of talking about what that, what I think that looks like from her perspective, but I was nodding my head. I go, yes, that, that we think about these other entities in the natural world as being um, relatives um, and nations. So so to build upon that, it's it's recognizing that environmental justice is extending it beyond the human dimension. And often it's very human oriented, which is absolutely needs to happen. Clearly the state and proponents and industry are doing not good things and there needs to be a focus on that. But for us, for thousands of years of our existence, we would have been trying to ensure uh, environmental justice um, with our, our relatives um, and the natural world by realizing um, rights and responsibilities. Rights tends to be in like the conventional sort of environmental justice realm. And then um, our responsibility sort of more in the indigenous realm, but obviously not, not only there. So, but part of the, but to me, it also means by going beyond human dimension that these other entities and elements also have reciprocal obligations to us. Um, so, for example, in the Anishinaabe conception of water is um, the relationship is reciprocal. Water is um, one of its uh, purposes is to support life. But when if humans come along and um, stop the flow of water, contaminate water, dump God knows what in water, then we've interfered. We we've committed an environmental injustice to water and water is no longer able to fulfill its responsibilities to support life. So harm is going to happen to aquatic life, it's going to happen to people. So to me, environmental justice is also how we relate in appropriate ways um, to the natural world, which we have guidance and instructions to do that. Um, and I do think a lot of that guidance and instruction is relevant to how we engage uh, with environmental justice uh, more broadly and 
you know, into historical and contemporary um, context. So what do we need to do? Um, well, anything that community is doing to support languages and the way of life, appropriate relations with the natural world, either through ceremonial or spiritual practices or on the land activities or education programs are, are how you would incorporate that into work. And as an educator, that's the kind of work um, I get um, involved in. And I think fundamentally what we want to do is to be able to support life. Like what are the things we're going to do to be able to, um, to support life? And I think Chelsea pointed to a number of things, but we want to, we want to, um, to be able to, to enable life, to be able to continue its, its, its work to support life. So we want to support pollinators. We don't want to contaminate. We want to support aquatic life so they can fulfill their responsibilities and duties, not just to people, but to other life, uh, water for fish. So that's all I would add to it. Did, did I think that already exists and has existed for thousands of years in a lot of people's own um, knowledge and, and nations and practices. And I think part of our work with environmental justice is to revitalize those because they're often not um, talked about. Of course, communities have to decide what they're willing to share externally or not share externally. But um, I always thought that we, are, we already had our own environmental justice principles and our own way of, of thinking. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Deborah, for that. So um, my next question is for Joseph. Um, Joseph, you mentioned that Indigenous solidarity, you know, beyond settler borders is very important for us to achieve environmental justice. So my question for you, and I can also open it up to anyone else, how can we as Indigenous people strengthen our Black and Indigenous solidarities to deepen the environmental justice conversations that have taken place so far in this symposium? So I will pass it to Joseph, then Amber, and then open to anyone else. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, I, th I think it's a very important question, and I think um, is really key to us uh, really moving forward and addressing the current climate crisis within the within the parameters that that we're in now. Right. So it's it's a crisis because we don't have any time left. There's no time left for us to say, I'm black, you're Indian, I'm white, you're this, I'm that, you're this. You know, we have differences that we, we can divide ourselves on. Um, the time for that is gone. Um, it shouldn't have happened in the first place. Um, it, you know, it's, it's due to ignorance, due to colonization and how, how colonialism works to divide us uh, rather than unite us. So, um, to build these kinds of solidarities between communities uh, of color, uh, specifically black and indigenous communities who, who've experienced extremely similar histories, right? Um, uh, you know, with, with important differences and variances that we all need to be aware of, but, but very, very similar histories in terms of dispossession, uh, displacement, um, right, slavery, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, you know, the, the same, you know, I study, part of what I study is land tenure, for example, and the same things that happen to Indians across reservations happen to Southern Black farmers in terms of, um, you know, uh, the way that the land uh, was divided, the way that inheritance uh, was used against um, uh, landowners in order to take land from them, um, et cetera. So, so there's, there's so much similarity in terms of our experiences if we only bother to educate ourselves. The way you do that um, is you step outside of your comfort zone and you get involved with organizations that that um, you know that, that focus on on uh, Black lives and and um, Black justice movements, etc. And and if you're if you're of Black descent yourself, you you focus you do the same with with Indian communities, right? Show up, show up and be part of those communities, engage with them, uh, share your story and hear theirs. Um, those kinds of things. There's no easy way to show solidarity. You, you, a, a Twitter post is as useless as the time it took you to put it up there. Um, you need to show up, you need to show political and physical, economic solidarity, and you need to speak out about what you see among these communities, right? Uh, and so, um, you know, they, they, they need to become relatives as they are, right? As they are in reality relatives to you as an indigenous or black person, right? So, so 
to, to do that, um, you need to, to act as a relative towards them. And so get involved in local, um, you know, uh, local movements, uh, black or indigenous movements. Um, and, and we need to show up together when it comes to protests, when it comes to standing up for black lives and Indian lives, uh, et cetera. These, these things are, um, are really important. And, and like I said, for us to address environmental injustices that continue to occur to all of our communities, um, we can't do it alone. We, we, we've tried that and, and the powers that be have solidified their power politically and economically. Um, we, 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 we just can't do it alone as small communities uh, with the few resources that we have or as small movements here and there, right? Uh, we, we have to all stand up together. So uh, if we want a hopeful future for ourselves, for, you know, if we're young enough, <laughs> if you're gonna live into the 2050s, for example, you know, let, let's hope that the 2050s are livable. Uh, let's hope they're livable on this planet. Um, let's hope the 2070s are livable on this planet. And if you have young children, they're almost certainly going to live to be into their 80s and 90s thanks to medical advancement. I don't want to be on this planet 90 years from now um, if things are as as is, if, if things keep going the way that they've been going. So, um, you know, if we want brighter futures for, for ourselves and our and our children, um, we really have to, to, to stop the divisions, to stop seeing people as different and start seeing ourselves um, as, as really part of the same <clears throat> river of colonialism, right? We're on the same boat that, that colonialism has put us on, uh, going down the same river of destruction. We, we need to do something about that together. Yeah, yeah thank you, Joseph, for that. Amber, how can we strengthen Black and Indigenous solidarities, especially to deepen the conversations around environmental justice that have taken place thus far in the symposium? I think you're on mute, or at least I can't hear you. Sorry, I pushed it in, of course, it, it rebelled. Um, so I just want to say I echo everything um, Joseph said, I, I think this question is um, really important. Um, I think that Black and Native folks and all you know, oppressed folks under um, settler colonialism and white supremacy and racial capitalism um, have to acknowledge that we have a mutual oppressor. And I think that that could be our starting point for solidarity, right? Um, we have to contextualize all of the things that all of us have endured and had to navigate under these systems, including the harms that we've caused each, each other. And I think it's really important to um, for us to acknowledge um, the harms and, you know, even if they weren't intentional, right? Like even if it was about um, taking care of our families and our, you know, in desperation, taking care of um, saving our lives, I think it's really important that we have discussions about the harm but also that we contextualize that harm. Um, I think it's really important that we listen to one another and also believe one another when we talk about um, what we're enduring under these systems. Um, I think that sometimes people tell, like share their stories, share um, you know, what's happening in their communities and then others might um, belittle that or um, not, take it, not take it as something that's actually happening. And I think that that's a, sometimes that causes us to, um, there's causes wedges in our communities. And so I think that listening, but also believing one another is crucial um, in establishing and maintaining solidarity. Um, the other thing I think is important that we learn about each other from one another, from ourselves, or learn about, you know, our respective communities from our respective communities. Because I think that what happens is a lot of times what we know about each other comes from our oppressors. And I think oftentimes that just is, that's often rooted in stereotypes and then just also um, falsehoods that um, colonizers and oppressors uh, tend to establish as a means of justifying the violence against us. Um, so I think it's really important that we learn from one another and then to challenge our biases that we have, you know, established in our own minds about one another. Um, so uh, I think to solidarity, I, I've been thinking about this um, a lot lately and I've been writing about it a lot, um, is that there's this, this idea that like we should just meet at the table. If we just meet at the table and hash out, you know, the things that are going on, like that is, that's a solution. But I, 
I want to challenge us and I want to encourage us instead of trying to meet at the table, which is often colonial, which is often there's only two spots for all people of color um, to let the land be our mediator and meet on the land um, and to recognize one another's indigeneity. Because I think sometimes um, Black folks aren't um, seen as displaced Indigenous peoples or the descendants of Indigenous peoples. Um, but my my African ancestors were Indigenous to um, their lands in Africa and were displaced off those lands, right? And so I think the land recognizes um, indigeneity even when it's displaced. And so I'm asking folks to challenge the idea that we need to meet at the table and instead use the land as a meeting spot and a place for, where we can talk about how we go forward and how we can practice um, not only solidarity, but future, futurity. Because I, I want us to think about you know, the ways in which we see it so distant and so far away versus like, we have to do that work now because empires fall, they always do. And if the empire falls, what do we do if we haven't spent the time getting to know each other, um, getting the time to heal our wounds, to contextualize the pain and the um, the harm that we've caused, right? And so, so I think solidarity requires us to do all this really hard and sometimes painful work. But when we say we wanna decolonize, when we say we want to build solidarities, this is what it means. It means that we have to sit down and get to know each other and be vulnerable. Um, and as my, you know, my mentor and homie, um, Dr. Kyle May says, is that we should share a meal together. We should have like a barbecue powwow where we get together and like eat and talk about things that are our, our realities. And then from there, um, I think we learn to root for one another. We learn to actually care for one another like we care for family, right? And so, um, yeah, there's no solidarity without learning from one another, listening to one another and believing one another. Yeah, thank you for that, Amber. I think it's very important, right, to reflect on wanting the position at the table when we should go back to the land, right? Because the land is our mother. So one of the questions that we have from the audience, and it kind of relates to a question that we had for the panel is, there has been recent increased environmental justice funding through the federal government, especially to the US government. And also there's been new opportunities presented by the new presidential administration that kind of has elevated tribal leaders. But my question is, have these opportunities actually elevated tribal leaders, indigenous communities, especially when discussing environmental justice and climate justice? And I will start with Deborah for this question. Okay, um, it's a great question and I'm really super keen to hear what others have to say about it, but I don't work in the, um, in the, in the uh, US context. So it's hard for me to answer that question specifically, but I can tell you about how it's playing out in the Canadian context. So similar kind of noises from the federal government, and I say noises, not like, I have no idea how it's going in, in, the, in the US and people will we'll sort that out, but that's what it kind of is federally in Canada. So you see a lot of the rhetoric around in Canadian public policy around climate change. We don't have the committee set up the same way that the Biden administration does. There isn't like this direct conversation you can have with leaders who are setting policy. Um, so despite climate change policy saying, we're gonna support indigenous leadership and indigenous knowledge, there actually isn't, as I mentioned before, there actually isn't any actual real support to do that. So um, organizations that I'm involved in, so the Assembly of First Nations, you know, represents the First Nations across the country, some on the Environment Climate Change Committee. So you kind of have to, again, um, you're in the advocacy role on the outside, kind of looking in and trying to advocate kind of through through that way. So there's a, so there's a lot of the rhetoric, there's a lot of the the policy statements, Indigenous-led climate um, leadership and, and research, but there isn't there isn't the corresponding funding or programming or <laughs> that goes along that goes along with that. Um, so that's kind of how it's play, playing out. I mean, it's better than it was because previous government was major climate deniers, but at least this one sort of knows, the current one kind of knows there's like something going on, like a lot of Canadian, uh, a lot of, well, actually indigenous lines is the way I look at it. It's been <clears throat> burned and, and continues to be so that's where people would be exercising their their rights and um, livelihoods so um, so that's that 
that's kind of how it's doing. But sometimes when you're in the radar, like the, the policies are putting you in, other people are paying attention, right? So ENGOs are and, and academia is. So, so other entities other than government are, are, are paying attention because it's mentioned. It's just people have something to say about climate leadership and climate change. So there's been more um, attention um, in, in that respect. So, um, so I'd say there's definitely more talking around it, but I would like to see more like real things happening on the ground to support it. So, so that's just some thoughts on the, in the Canadian context. And I'm really keen to hear and learn because I don't know how um, the question, like how that's playing out in the U.S. Maybe there's things I can learn from that that I can share with uh, folks, uh, folks that I work with. So um, hopefully that was helpful somehow. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Deborah, for bringing in the Canadian perspective, right? So our question is that there has been an increase in environmental justice funding and also tribal leaders being appointed to positions such as at Departments of Interior, Energy, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. So the question, and I will pass it um, to Chelsea, is do you think these steps are in the right direction? Thank you for that question. I was actually going to send a message and say, I can help to answer this if if needed. Um, so I think they're in a good direction. I don't think it's the right direction. Uh, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. But I will say that a few of the folk that um, have been um, added into the positions, key positions of these departments have really opened up access to dialogue, um, not only between the tribal nations and the federal government, but also the NGOs, the non-governmental um, organizations, like the nonprofits, the uh, local communities, and with their tribal nations in together with the, with the federal government. I think that has not happened um, in the little time that I've been around um, at this at the level that it has been. And it seems like these conversations and these meetings are a lot more proactive and with the with the consideration of healing. Um, again, these this one meeting that I've been to, I think there were probably like two more before that have have been one of the first ones that I've heard about. And I it just, it feels good to be a part of, but it also is the question of like, why haven't, why hasn't this happened in the past? Why, um, well, happy that it's happening now and how is this going to continue in the future to have these conversations um, to build upon? And then also on the funding piece, uh, there has been some communities that I know of and community leaders that I know of that have taken um advantage of these opportunities. And it is also increasing the conversation about, for example, like how is redevelopment going to happen in some of these areas that were not, that we didn't know industry was going to contaminate the lands or the, the water. Um, and so that's been pretty, pretty good to hear. It's also hard, hard to hear, but also healing um, and trying to find like, what are those solutions and those options for the near future? Um, there's more here that I can help to, to answer, but I'll, I'll turn it over um, to the next person. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea, for bringing up that there's a lot of first happening for our Indigenous communities. So Jacqueline, do you think these are steps in the right direction or what is your opinion and take on this? Thank you. Um, well, of course, um, I believe that any time uh, people of color are um, are included, appointed, hired, asked, is always the right direction. Um, especially when there's policy funding and laws that affect those people of color's lives. And so I believe it is in the right, uh, right direction. And also, um, you know, just my uh, limited um, uh, involvement in the FACA, um, you know, the uh, Federal Advisory um, Council Act, you know, with the NEJAC and the WEJAC having, I don't sit on the tribal seat on the NEJAC, I sit on the non-governmental seat. But, um, you know, my colleagues that, you know, there's a tribal seat specifically for tribal nations on the NEJAC. 
um, the we um, the WEJAC, the White House Environmental Justice Council, has um, multiple uh, tribal voices on that, and they have a. Uh, um, a separate tribal uh, working group, um, you know, addressing tribal um, legacy environmental justice issues. So there's other um, there's other pathways and other pockets uh, within the federal government where um, the tribal voice has been risen to you know invite you, you know to places. Um, that are nice, you know, and for um, our expertise in our lives is being not only um, acknowledged because it has, it, 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 we've always been, it, it's, but been acted upon, you know, and, um, but the uh, wheels of uh, justice move slowly as we know, and the right direction you know, it's not going to be a fast path. I know fast pace, but it is in the right direction. Thank you so much for asking the question. Yeah, thank you, Jacqueline, for bringing that up. Um, so moving on to Amber and Joseph, do you think these are steps in the right direction that the current administration is taking, especially as it relates to more indigenous representation at these environmental agencies and the environmental justice discourse? Yeah, um, again, echoing um, all the other panelists, um, I think representation is important. Um, when, but I, you know, I'm often suspicious of it because I also think um, it's an attempt to reinforce um, colonial power, like imperial power. Um, but I also know the value of having someone um, who has a you know, connection to community and um, is interested in actually, um, you know, dismantling systems. Uh, and so I do think that um, having um, folks, indigenous folks um, in positions of power is crucial to chipping away at that um, institutional power. However, you know, I think we have to be suspicious of the intent of, um, you know, colonial governments when placing people um, like us, you know, from our communities in those those high level positions. Um, yeah, uh, because I, I understand colonial institutions to not really be interested in decolonizing, right? That is their demise. And so I think, uh, you know, it, it would be a, a very slow process because um, yeah, I'm, I'm really, weary of that. I think that indigenous peoples, oppressed peoples um, are more genius than our oppressors. And so I think that we have the ability to even navigate when put into those positions. But I also think it is very much a David and Goliath um, situation when you put, you know, one person of color who represents, then represents all indigenous people or all black folks. Um, there's an expectation that they're able to solve centuries of oppression and centuries of exploitation and violence. And I think that's a really hard burden to place on someone um, who has like all the right intentions, who has like their community's um, best interests in power. Um, and I, I mean, I say kudos to uh, indigenous peoples, other people of color who actually, you know, get into those positions and try to do the real work of dismantling. But I don't know if like the master's tools can actually, you know, bring down the master's house. Um, but I do think about infiltrating and how there have been many of historical, you know, examples of how inf infiltrating have um, slowly brought down the master's house. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I think representation is important. I think that it is great to have people in power who look like us and who are brave enough to speak out against, you know, empire and um, institutional power. Um, I think it's a very um, interesting dance to have to do. Um, and I can only imagine the burden and only imagine like the desire to want to, um, you know, to address all of the problems, you know, like when you get in that position of power, it's, it's like not just envir environmental justice, it's like, what else can we also address while I'm in this seat for this many years, right? And so kudos to people who get there and are not, um, and, and keep a, a vision of like, this is why I'm here and do it um, even when, you know, people disagree with them. Um, I, I can only imagine that burden. So. 
yeah, represent, representation is important. Having people in those key positions is important, but we have to remember, I think we have to keep in the back of our head that like colonial institutions are not interested in their own demise. Thank you, Amber, for that. So in the, you know, being mindful of time and also because I want Deborah and Jacqueline to give us our closing remarks. Paduchi, everyone, for participating in this panel. And thank you for listening to everyone who has great expertise on these issues. So Jacqueline and Deborah, do you mind giving um, closing words, especially a message tailored to our youth and the seven generations to come? <laughs> Oh, go ahead, Deborah. I was just going to say, I think you should have the last word because uh, I'm the interloper from the <laughs> across the border, so you should. You okay. should. Um, I I think in in the work that I do, the the message I try to give to to youth is when I try to um, like really try to support indigenous led um, youth, like not me coming in as some middle aged lady telling them how they should think about things, like really trying to support what what they would like to do to to recognize that they are climate change storytellers and that they they could, they should be part of the vision about what they want to see for the future so that they can start inheriting like solutions instead of problems <laughs> from uh, past and future generations um, that they have important knowledge to share like we're experiencing climate change our ancestors have so those stories of their families matter so they have really valuable knowledge um, to share and they just kind of need the means to to share and folks like me need to um, be better um, at listening. So their experience really matters. And I think I would just just end with this that um, what they know, what what they know, like the UN talks about this and, and other researchers is that Indigenous peoples caretake about 20% of the, the, the planet's um, landmass. And that's where about 80% of the biodiversity is. And that's where Indigenous languages are spoken. We know stuff. And uh, um, and I just give that message to say that all those initiatives that occur around language realization, land-based work really, really matters in terms of envisioning um, a future, uh, a future for ourselves. And, you know, they have my support in, in, in doing that. So um, Chumugash for this opportunity and I'll turn it over to, to Jacqueline. Hello. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, many of you who, uh, joined us last year and including my panelists, uh, Chelsea and Deborah, know that I lost my child, my youth, uh, my son, Tabaha. Uh, he was 15. I lost him on uh, New Year's Day 2021 from fentanyl poisoning. So to the um, youth, I want to say you are alive. Be alive. You can be native and be alive and that is good enough. If you want to live home and just take care of your family and your elders and your little brothers and sisters, that's good enough. If you just want to take care of your little plot of land and animal and dog and cat, that's good. If you want to stay home on your reservation all your life and don't go out to Go get some big fancy college education. That's good enough. You're indigenous. You're tribal. You are the salt of this earth. And the earth is salt of you. Our children know so much more than us adults do about the life and the birth and the death of this earth. Two months before my son died, he came into the living room and he said, Mom, you know, um, we came from black people and I thought he was talking about the out of Africa there. I said, yeah, I know that. He goes, no, Mom. My spirit God came to me last night. The black people made this earth. The native people, we designed it. And he showed me the planes. He was trying to explain his vision. And he said, your tribe went up north so they wouldn't kill you. And that's why you, but you fell in love with the environment. That's how come your people want to 
protect the Arctic so much. You stayed when the rest of us came back down. He, my son was half Yupik and half Dene. So when I see a black person now, I have a different look at them based on what my child said about how black people and tribal people made and designed this earth. Our children are so much. And we were, we are all the seven generation. Remember that. There were seven generations before us. There's seven generations after us. Whether you're elder, mid, baby, youth, we are all the seventh generation. Koyana for having us today. Thank you.